Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to take a little opportunity today to highlight a, a piece of legislation that officially was done last week, but it's important to do it publicly. Um, and a huge thank you for the folks that are all part of our public safety teams, um, whether it's focusing on violent crimes and reducing those against persons, or it's reducing thefts. And in this case, um, just something that has spiked across the country and here in Minnesota, the thefts of catalytic converters for their, uh, their precious metals that they're trying to get out of them. I want to give a thank you to the, the folks that made this happen, starting out with Senator Marty. Uh, Representative Richardson was a big part of this. Um, the folks are going to hear from uh, Drew Evans over at BCA. You're going to hear from Chief Sturgeon and the law enforcement folks who have been involved in this. And then I think the message to Minnesotans of um, an expectations of safety of both person and property needs to be very high. If there's things that we can do um, to both make it harder to do some of these things and then sending a very strong message of accountability. If you're a person either stealing these or buying these catalytic converters, there needs to be a, a harsh penalty for it. We need to disincentivize a crime that it was all too easy for folks to do. And and apparently, before this piece of legislation, all too easy to move um, those catalytic converters that they took off. So I, I'm just grateful that this is the type of work that's being done, once again, addressing an issue that came up, working with the folks who are most on the ground dealing with that, and then coming up and crafting a piece of legislation that if I, I'll listen to the authors of this, but had wide, nearly unanimous support, and now to hear from the experts who say whether this will make a difference, which I believe it will, um, one step forward again for protecting Minnesotans' property. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the chief Senate author on this, someone who's worked on this for, uh, for quite some time, Senator John Marty. Thank you, Governor, and um, it is time. We've been working three years. We've seen all kinds of reports from Moorhead, from every part of the state. Rochester had 20 school buses hit in one night a year or two ago. We've been trying to get it heard for three years. We finally got a hearing, and now we've passed it, and I'm very excited about that. I want to call out, especially we worked with Representative Ruth Richardson over these years and law enforcement across the state and prosecutors and also point out the auto theft investigation unit at Department of Commerce and Agent Joe Baki, who helped us come up with the concept of catalytic converters worth six, seven, eight hundred dollars just for the scrap metal in them. Those things, there's no way to identify which car they come from. We came up with the idea of coming up and saying, you know, you don't have to have them labeled with the vehicle identification number until they're removed from the car. And Agent Baki and we and Representative Richardson came up with a legislative idea. Um, we had strong support as we worked with the law enforcement agencies and prosecutors. Everybody agrees this can make a difference. It's not going to end the crime. We know that. But it will make it a lot harder for people to sell. It will make them a lot harder for people to evade. We've had law enforcement reports around the state where they'll stop a car with four or five cutoff converters in the back seat. And they have no probable cause to stop them. Now in Minnesota, it will be a crime after August 1st to possess a used catalytic converter that's not attached to a car unless it has the vehicle identification number written on it, which is easy for you to do. It's easy for a muffler shop repairing cars to do. It's easy for a scrap dealer to do. It's not easy for a thief to do because if they write it on there, they got your pin for theft. If you don't put it on there, you're breaking the law, the same level of theft. So it's a simple thing to do that the thieves can't get around that way. Um, creative bunch, but we've got a good step forward. With that, I'll turn it over to Representative Cedric Fraser. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I'm standing in for my good friend and colleague, Ruth Richardson, who couldn't be here, but I know this is a passion of hers to get this done. Um, just like in her community, my community was suffering from these um, catalytic converted thefts. And so putting this legislation together, like uh, Senator Marty said, it was a creative way to do it. And now we're going to hold people accountable for not only stealing them, but also for those that are purchasing them. And we're looking forward to um, getting this in place and for the governor to provide his signature. Thank you. Next, BCA Superintendent Drew Evans. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Drew Evans. I'm superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. I think what you're seeing today with this bill signing is what happens in Minnesota when we come together with common sense solutions and work in a way collectively together to really pass policy that's going to impact Minnesotans' lives. Here's a good example of Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, Minnesota Sheriff's Association. We have our partners at the Commerce Fraud Bureau, St. Paul Police Department, and others that came together working with our state legislature to develop policy that's really going to impact this crime. 
I think there's probably very few Minnesotans that don't know somebody that's had a catalytic converter stolen from their vehicle. And this legislation was designed to thwart that. It creates penalties, as Senator Marty noted, for possessing catalytic converters without a serial number or the VIN number affixed to that particular catalytic converter. It creates business regulation that protects good businesses that are doing this day in, day out, so that we don't have an opportunity for those who choose to thwart our laws to engage in the buying of these. So it goes at both the supply and the demand side of this particular crime that we've seen so often. And then what we're creating is this new database, a database that will be able to enter in catalytic converters as they're purchased, and that will be available to all the Minnesota law enforcement so that they can see who's selling these, who's purchasing them, and to make sure that we have an eye on the trade of catalytic converters as they're legitimately moved for scrap in the state, but we're eliminating the environment and the, the sale of these particular uh, catalytic converters in the illicit market. And so uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Chief Brian Sturgeon in the West uh, St. Paul Police Department. Good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Brian Sturgeon. I'm Chief of Police for the City of West St. Paul. On behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association in the City of West St. Paul, first off, I want to thank Representative Richardson and uh, Senator Marty for fighting for this bill. Three long years it took to where we are today. And for that, we are all grateful. Being a victim of theft of your Calais converter does not know any socioeconomic boundaries. Victims are single parents. Senior citizens, students, teachers, and business owners, just to mention a few. Many of these individuals depend on their sole vehicle to get to work, take their kids to schools or to activities, and make medical appointments. It can take months to obtain a replacement Cali converter, and they are expensive. It's a huge financial burden to many in our community. Well, St. Paul is not unlike many other cities in Minnesota. From 2020 to 2021, we saw a 700% increase, 700% increase in Cali converter thefts. We have done educational efforts, converter marking events, and made many arrests. The state of Minnesota needed to implement a more stringent regulations, and today, after three years, they have finally done so. This bill will no doubt reduce the amount of illegally contained converters, again, illegally obtained converters, sold for scrap and recycling. Again, thank you for everyone who has worked on this bill for three long years to make it happen. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Thank you once again to all the folks who are involved in this, the public safety folks. We'll sign it up. That's it. We'd be glad to take any questions if you got some on-topic ones to start with and you need anything from the folks up here, the professionals. Governor, did you sign the bill with the scout's VIN number? No, I should have. I, uh, those of you know I drive a 79 International on this. Uh, and I said I did not have one stolen, but I've had a catalytic converter go out, and I think the chief was telling you right. They are super expensive. It's pretty shocking to folks, noting that we have catalytic converters to reduce air pollution, so they're an important thing, but um, pretty important. In, the, uh, in one of the committee hearings, the metal recycling industry person said that these things are going out of state anyway, so this won't make a dent. Uh, does the Commerce Department or, or John, Senator Marty have something to say about that? Sure. We know some have been sold out of state. They're going to sell them anywhere they can sell them. Now the illicit ones, they will have a lot more trouble. The only buyers allowed to buy in Minnesota will be scrap metal dealers, registered scrap metal dealers, and the BCA will keep their hand on it, and local law enforcement can. You can't have the people coming in, which has been the practice now. You advertise on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, and we'll meet you. Oh, you got converters to sell. We'll meet you at the shopping mall um, parking lot at 7 in the morning on Saturday. We'll buy what you got. Can't do that anymore. We got several restrictions. The auto theft investigators came up with six principles of things you need to do to crack down on converter theft. 
and they acknowledged, they said our bill accomplished all of them. So we've been waiting three years to get it done and we're making it happen. Other questions? Could one of the law enforcement officers uh, talk about why there's been such an increase in catalytic converter thefts in recent years especially? I believe that people just realized what uh, the financial incentive for them to um, take the catalytic converters and to resell them be because of the high costs that they receive, um, the large amount of money that they receive from recycling these. Um, they've learned that literally it takes two minutes. Pull up to a car and with a sawzall and take off the catalytic converter. And unfortunately, I think social media has a lot to do with it because we're hearing more and more about this 24-7, about the issues of catalytic converters and how easy it is to obtain them and to um, sell them to a uh, scrapyard to recycle. So it, it, I, I just b truly believe that people are realizing that's very easy to do so, to commit this type of crime. One, one of my colleagues, when we he said, why is this happening? And we point out that of the valuable metals, trace amounts in these converters, rhodium is twi 12 times the price of gold. He said, you bolt something under your car that's worth 12 times the price of gold, you think you might have a problem. And that's what people have caught on to, and that's why there's been such an uptick in the thefts. The extra bookkeeping and the, the database for the scrap dealers, is there any increased pen penalties for the scrap dealers in this? We, we tried to track, we're not... We're trying to track with theft penalties. You buy stolen property over $1,000, it's a felony. Under a thousand, it's gross misdemeanor. Five hundred. We tried to track those penalties, assuming a converter is worth five hundred dollars, when a lot of them can go for over a thousand bucks scrap. And so we tried to track that. And if you're buying, selling anything you're doing with it, it depends on the volume. So if you're doing three or more, more than three, it would be a felony. And if it's seventy or more, it'd be heavy level felony. So we're trying to crack down every step along the way. It's basically is it assuming because 99.9% .9 of the ones that are being sold by individuals and so on are, are stolen. So we're treating it as a theft penalty. Could this legislation lead to other states passing it and then get to the auto manufacturers where they stamp the VIN numbers on the converters? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, that'll be our feedback. You know, to the original question about, you know, if they're going out of state, well, we control what happens in Minnesota, and we're going to put an environment in place in Minnesota that it dissuades this type of criminal activity from occurring, and this bill does just that in many different ways. Uh, what we will do, though, is a number of us here are dialed in with our partners from across the United States. I think this gives a very good roadmap for the rest of the country on legislation that we think will have a big impact on this, and of all 50 states adopt it, we'll certainly be talking to our counterparts across the country. Do you have any concern about the delay in effective date, uh, those months in between? I would just say with any legislation, there's time to start up, and we'll be doing that diligently where we are. There isn't these protections in place right now, so we're in the current state. We'll certainly work uh, to get the database and others that we need to get stood up within that time period, but uh, we'll be working on that. We don't have a concern because it's the current status of the law right now, but we'll get this done as soon as we can, and then we'll have the effective date as soon as it comes online. You said this would be a roadmap. Is Minnesota the first state to develop a database? Yes, this is the first proposal to do this. We've been saying the auto theft investigators said this would be model legislation. So we as law enforcement and prosecutors are going to be talking with our colleagues around the country. We hope others copy it as well. If this happens nationally, we will really, really cut into the converter theft problem. Off topic. Gov Governor, can you answer these? want to. Off topic, Governor, sure. uh, any comments on the changes in leadership with the uh, Veterans Affairs Department? And yeah, I think many of you know this has been a passion of mine basically my whole life of, of myself serving and then the work as the ranking member in the House VA committee, always trying to up the, uh, up the care of our veterans. I don't want to get involved in, in some of the, the HR sides of things, but I think... Um, an environment where the workforce is respected, making sure that they're at the top quality to be able to deliver. And I think that the leadership over at the department made the decision that it was time to look for new leadership. And so I certainly support them in their move to, 
to move to that accountability piece. Did they check in with you before they made this change? Or uh, they, they run it by afterwards, but they manage their, their manager agencies. I'm uh, ultimately accountable for the agencies, but we certainly don't micromanage them as they know that this is an area probably of, of all the areas that I feel most comfortable with and know the VA best. Um, so I keep a pretty close eye on that and they, uh, they acknowledged it. I want to acknowledge the, the legislators and the folks who work in a bipartisan manner around this. This is how these things are supposed to work. Just make sure we continue to get good quality care. Um, I would say it, I hope it makes the case for us. We know one of the things at that place is we need to up the physical plant. I've been asking for that for a while. I think it's a tough environment to work in. Um, you got to deliver meals outside in the winter across from one building to another. That is just not best practice. And I think all of that leads to a, a, a pretty tough work environment, but we need to deliver the best we can. Governor, is the state taking any steps ahead of the possible indictment of former President Trump? Any public safety measures? Yeah, we've mentioned it like many things that, um, of course, uh, Superintendent Evans was here and um, DPS commissioner. Um, we've talked about it, asked them. They do a little bit more. They always monitor, but they monitor social media. They monitor if there's plans to be there. We certainly, again, um, everything we do needs to be in a way that folks can express their First Amendment rights. They have the right to gather. They have the right to petition their government. Um, just making sure all those things are done safely. But I do think it's always prudent, and I think we've learned over the last three years um, to be prepared. If you've got big crowds, things can happen. So yes, they're, they're looking at it. But at this time, I can tell you there is no indication at all that there was anything out of the ordinary or anything planned. Do you, is somebody keeping a, a tab of money that's been spent so you don't overspend the, the surplus by the time you get to the end of the session? Or is yeah. it, do you have a running tally or do you know what that number is? Yeah, and um, I'm, I'm pretty good at budgeting. Um, we will make sure, and we do not, we are obligated by law to make sure that we uh, have balanced budgets. We have done that. Um, we have created a surplus at the same time reducing taxes on Minnesotans. So uh, there are safeguards in place. There are things that, that need to be done. We will continue to make sure that we're focusing on that. And I think one of the things is we're seeing a lot of positive results in Minnesota's economy. Part of this surplus is a big piece of it was, was of course, corporate profits that are growing. We saw last year record profits in um, exports. We're seeing record startups in businesses. Uh, all of those things are a positive. So I think for Minnesotans to, to look and break down, um, we're investing in the future. And you know, yes, we will. And yes, they will be balanced. We're required by law. Yes, we have delivered balanced budgets and we'll continue to do so. Hi. Um, there's some disappointment in the long-term care community that there's still not a, a request from you for additional funds to help staff, either pay staff or recruit or pay for other expenses for long-term care staff. Can you uh, Yeah, we passed that? the most extensive contract negotiations on personal care providers that we've done that. Now, you might be specific. There's a difference between long-term care, home health care, or skilled nursing facilities. So if you want to be specific of who's asking, we've invested in last year, I proposed uh, over $800 million that was in the budget deal that was walked away by Republicans. Um, I think one of the things that you can expect is you will see a historic investment in both long-term care, child care, and some of these other things we talked about with the budget. So I just encourage those folks. Um, we know that there's more that we need to do. We know, and I am deeply concerned um, with the workforce that's involved there, and will continue. As I said, the first uh, move we've made this year was the approval of those contracts with the personal care attendants, bringing them up to a livable wage. Now we need to get them even a little higher. So I think what they can expect over the next um, the next seven weeks is a uh, probably the most, I would assume, the largest investment they're going to see in making sure long-term care is taken care of. But I'm going to I'm going to come back to this this same issue. The global thing we're trying to do, create a long time, a, a long vision workforce for Minnesota, ways that we fill that pipeline and having a really candid conversation that industries like child care and long term care simply have not paid people enough to have people go into it and we saw massive shortages. That's why you needed the National Guard to go into some of these facilities. So these industries are going to have to recognize the business model that they're operating on is not working. And we're going to try and be supportive as we can to make sure that happens, whether it's reimbursement rates or making sure that workforce is able to be there. But we need their help and cooperation to, to help make that happen. And so um, you'll see the investments in that. I think they'll be pleasantly surprised on how 
uh, on how it works out because it has to. I've made the case that if this is going to be the best state uh, in the country to raise your children and raise a family, that means caring for our parents. And, and we both know caring for those who need it and caring for children are two of the most underfunded and most difficult professions we have right now. Minnesota's making historic investments to bring that up. So we'll get there. Well, I want to thank you all and um, appreciate you coming.